Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. As you know, the prophet Amos was a shepherd. While we think of him making a living with declarations about justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, he actually paid the bills watching sheep. No one except maybe King David knew more about sheep anywhere in scripture than Amos. One day, while Amos was minding his own business, tending his sheep, God gave Amos a vision about what needed to, be happen what needed to happen with the nation Israel. The humble herdsmen left the hills of Tekoa near Bethlehem and headed north to deliver God's message. It was a vision of future judgment for Judah and for Israel. God's words were a scorched earth denunciation against all nations and all leaders who had harmed God's people. Then just at the moment when Israel was cheering at the prophet, leveling all of their enemies, Amos turned his full throttle message on Israel themselves. He said they had hurt themselves too by being complacent, by worshiping their worship instead of worshiping God, by feeding their greed, by acting with cruelty to the poor, and by living lives that lacked spiritual integrity and heartfelt obedience to God. He questioned how other concerns had taken the place of God in their lives. They had turned against each other rather than turning toward God. When the shepherd was done, and he only spent a few weeks with his prophecy. This is kind of interesting because we think of the prophets as long lived, as long serving, but that's not the case with Amos. He was there just a few weeks. When he was done, he had leveled the entire playing field of faith. Not one person could count themselves greater than anyone else. No one was spared God's hard-hitting judgment from the herdsmen of Tekoa. And just before he left, he offered one verse of hope. His last words, I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord. Then he picked up his shepherd's staff and returned to his flock on the hills of Tekoa. He left every single man, woman, and child with a lot to think about and a lot to change about themselves and their behavior. No one was left without a thought. Although not a shepherd, Jeremiah, another great prophet of scripture whose voice we heard today, had deep concerns about the present pain and future of his people as well. Now for 40 years, Jeremiah was a prophet of God to five kings of Judah. As he watched God's people slide into destruction, he cried out, stop, turn around, and return to God. In today's passage, he laments, oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep all day long and night and for the, for the slain of the poor people. Lost sheep and matters of their care or lack of care enter Jeremiah's prophetic vision continuously throughout his years. He wrote at least eight different times about sheep. He concluded his final words about sheep in Jeremiah 50. My people are lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, causing them to roam the mountains. They have wandered from mountain to hill. They have forgotten where they rest. That's a very powerful image. They have forgotten where they rest, where they have a place of peace. Sheep keep being mentioned, not because they're cute zoo animals or we can go out to somebody's farm and see them all packaged up in certain areas. That's not why they're being mentioned. They're being mentioned because they reflect the economy and the way life ran in this, th these times. Sheep were huge in the e economic success of the region. If the sheep and the herds failed, 
the economy was in trouble. They were sort of like the canary in the coal mine, if you will. In Luke 16, Jesus picks up on the story of rural economy and the ways in which people drive that economy. He tells the story of a big landowner and his trickster CFO. In this tale, the boss, who apparently made his fortune lending out land in return for overpayment in produce, learns that his manager was less than devoted to increasing his master's fortune. Jesus doesn't say whether the manager was inept or dishonest, but the owner decided to call for an audit and send the guy packing. That's when the debt collector for hire initiates a new and creative management strategy to try to save something from all of this, including his job. Both boss and CFO knew that the tenant farmer's debts would probably never be paid in full. A drought, a flood, a plague of insects, and all other normal catastrophes that regularly happen in a sharecropper's uh, life give fewer and fewer chances of getting out of debt. They knew that. They both knew that they were destined to fail. But here's where the manager proves that he's smarter than the boss gives him credit for. He calls in the people who are defaulting on their loans and offers them a discount in return for their immediate payment. The genius of this situation is that the new payment is within the means of the debtors. It brings otherwise unattainable income to the owner, and it puts the manager in good graces with both sides. It's an ethically questionable situation of win, win, and win. Was Jesus accepting the trickery in light of the results? It does seem so, doesn't it? First, explaining the manager's activity, he advises, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, or wealth. Mammon, if you know, it's, it's a better word in this context, and it actually is what you'll find in the King James Version. Mammon is a better word for wealth here, because mammon is surplus money. It's more than you need to live life decently, right? A few lines later, Jesus warns, you cannot serve both God and this excess wealth, right? Jesus seems to be saying that the mammon has questionable, questionable value in itself, but can and should be used for good. In his encyclical offered during the pandemic called Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis makes the same point. He looks to St. John Chrysostom, one of the fathers of the church who taught, not to share our wealth, think mammon, with the poor, is to rob them and to take away their livelihood. The riches we possess are not our own, but theirs as well. Some may call Chrysostom naive, some may call him a socialist, others may label him a communist. Whatever your choice, in his own day, he was exiled by the empress who refused to tolerate his critique of the lavish life of the clergy that she had and the court that she ran. Nevertheless, his ideas reflected Jesus' own teaching. There's no getting around it. As Luke moves toward the climax of his gospel, his emphasis on reverence for life and thriving of the poor grows stronger in each verse. Today's gospel praising the wily manager is a gentle introduction to what will be coming in the chapters ahead. So let's return to Francis for a moment, a few more times before I sit down. Amid the pandemic, he wrote this uh, Fratelli Tutti as a reflection on the solidarity that humanity could have created when faced by our common vulnerability. It was the first piece that I remember being written late in 2020 about hope in the midst of the pandemic from an economic point of view and from a theological point of view. Francis described the pre-COVID world as one that perhaps, like the big landowner in Luke, fed on dreams of grandeur and consumed distraction, insularity, and solitude. His prescription for such a world goes to the heart of the wily manager's methodology. He calls for us to cultivate a shared passion, a community of belonging and solidarity, worthy of our time, energy, and resources. It's that simple, and it's that challenging. Amos and Jeremiah demonstrate with prophetic power how to look at reality with eyes that perceive how our social norms give, to, give in to access or excess, leaving others to languish. 
It's not time to ask which of our social systems, or excuse me, is it not time to ask which of our social systems are truly worthy of the respect that they're given in the law? When the unrighteous manager went around the law, might we say that he advanced a community of solidarity that was actually building something better? Might Jesus just tell us, go and do likewise? Beyond the process of farm management and developing our community of belonging and solidarity, we are not yet done with the sheep, nor are the sheep done with us. So let me circle back. There's something about their smell that begs our attention. Back on Monday, Thursday, March 28th, 2013, a rather young pope, who at the age of 74 at the time, called on his priests to go outside of themselves, said these words. He noted that too many of them had become managers of their congregations. They sat at desks and be they became dissatisfied. They'd lost heart. They reflected a sense of being collectors of antiquities and novelties. He said to them, if you do not go outside of yourself by being a mediator between God and humanity, you gradually become a manager, and God did not call you to be a manager. God called you to be a pastor, so go and smell like the sheep. He said, bring the healing power of God's grace to everyone in need, to stay close to the marginalized and be shepherds living with the smell of the sheep. He continued, when you don't put your own skin and your own heart on the line, you never hear a warm, heartfelt thanks from those you've helped. If you don't hang out with the sheep, they rub off on you. If you hang out with the sheep, they rub off on you and you smell like them. And when you start smelling like them, that's a good thing. As a pastor, Pope Francis's words hit home. It is easy to get caught up in the paperwork, the emails, the desk work, the meetings, and forget the people and their concerns. It's, we all fall prey to that in some way or another. Since COVID, more and more of us have sought Zoom rooms rather than being together in meeting rooms, right? For safety and a lot of reasons. We've sought isolation rather than congregation. We've sought staying away to stay safe and secure rather than coming together and coming to know one another. We can't smell the sheep. We can only smell ourselves which may or may not be similar. But when we emerge and when we go out, we have the opportunity to stir up God's grace and engage others right where they are. We see their eyes. We hold their hands. We pray together again. We embrace and we gain strength together. One last thought. I texted the only shepherd I know before this sermon my cousin, Ruth Parker. I asked her about the smell of the sheep. She texted me back, you only text me when you have questions about sheep. And I acknowledge that that's actually true. So. And then she said, well, to tell you the truth, Tim, all livestock have a smell. Sheep add the hint of lanolin on the wool breeds. And I'm thinking to myself, there are non-wool breeds? <laughs> so, but I don't think they smell more than any other form of livestock, maybe even less, because they live out in a pasture. Wow, I think she's right. Doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I kind of like their smell. Pigs, on the other hand, woo! That's how her text ended. I love this response. Only a shepherd would reflect on pigs, right? Just getting out in the pasture to care for the woolly ones is enough. It's enough. It's enough for each one of us to do. And then we realize there's not much of a smell at all because we're with family. We're together again, right? In the spirit of Amos and Jeremiah, let's get out there. Let's do some work together. And in the spirit of Jesus, let's get with the program. And when we do, we might find that we all smell like the sheep. Amen.